Your best-selling book, uh, new book, Return of the God Hypothesis, you argue there are three big scientific discoveries that point to the existence of God. And I want to go through these. One, the Big Bang Theory. So why would that lend support to a theory of a God? Or God? Well, right, Let, maybe just a little framing uh, before I dive into the evidence. Um, uh, Professor Dawkins at Oxford yeah. has said that the universe has precisely the properties that we should expect if at bottom there is no purpose, no design, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And though I'm on the opposite side of this science mm. v. God issue with, with the good professor, I think he does a marvelous job of framing key issues. And this is one of those great framing quotations. Mm. Because what he's saying is that, that whether we think of it as a scientific question or a philosophical question or both, if we have a hypothesis about reality, the way we test that is by looking at the world around us and seeing if what we see comports with what we would expect to see if our hypothesis were true. Mm. And his hypothesis is that of blind, pitiless indifference, which is a, a shorthand way of saying that everything came about by strictly undirected material processes. And what the materialists expected coming into the early 20th century was evidence of an eternal self-existent universe, mm. one that had been here for an infinitely long time and therefore did not need an external creator. What in fact the astrophysicists, the cosmologists, the astronomers found was evidence of a universe that had a definite beginning and therefore one that could not have created itself because before the matter of the universe came into existence, there was no matter there to do the causing. And so the, the picture of the universe that has emerged starting from the 1920s all the way to the present, both from observational astronomy and from theoretical physics is a universe that had a definite beginning and therefore requires some sort of external creator or cause. Dawkins is obviously one of the world's most famous atheists. Are you a, a believer in God yourself? I do believe in God, yes. Okay, so let's yeah. play a clip from Dawkins on this show. Yes. So why is it not possible that there is a superior being, power, which many people believe in, in different it's ways? It's possible different, there different are fairies at the bottom God. of the garden. I mean, all sorts of things are possible. <laughs> you, you, you can't deny that. Well, except I've never seen fairies in the garden, have you? No, you've never seen God either. No, but you don't know for sure that either doesn't exist. No, I don't know that fairies don't exist. Fairies may well, they may be leprechauns, <laughs> for all I know. You know, my big question for all atheists, well, is, OK, you don't believe in God, but what was there before the Big Bang, before this all started? What was, in other words, what was there before supposedly nothing? What is nothing? Nothing, to me, seems to be a totally incongruous word. What is nothingness? And if you can't explain it, it to me, and I believe in God, but to me, it suggests there must be a, a power bigger than the human mind at the start of all this that was able to comprehend what may have happened, because we can't. Right. Uh, Dawkins wants to portray theistic belief as if it's uh, equivalent to belief in fairies. Mm. And, uh, and he'll concede that, well, it's possible. But I think there's a stronger argument for the, the, the theistic case. Mm. And that is that when scientists and philosophers reason from evidence, they typically use a method of reasoning that has a technical name is called inferring to the best explanation, where the best explanation is one that, where you're invoking a cause which has the kind of powers that would be required to explain the, the phenomenon of interest. Mm. And you correctly pointed out in your conversation with him that when you get back to that, what physicists mm. often call the singularity, mm. the point where matter, space, time, and energy begin to exist, the materialist is really up against a, a huge conundrum because prior to the origin of matter, there is no matter to do the causing. That's mm. what we mean by the origin mm. of matter, that that's where it starts. Right. And so if you want to invoke a cause which is sufficient to explain the origin of matter, you can't invoke matter. It's in principle, the materialistic explanations yes. are in principle insufficient. So you need to invoke something which is external to the material universe mm. and is not bounded by time and space as well. And that starts to paint a picture of the kind of cause you would need that has the, the sort of attributes that traditional theists have uh, tra traditionally associated with God. God is a, a timeless, uh, God is outside of time and space, has causal powers, is, is an agent with volition, and therefore can initiate a change of state from, in this case, nothing to something. And do you believe that God uh, created this original single cell that, from which everything flows to us? Oh, the single cell as opposed to the universe? 
Well, I guess yeah. you, go, you go back to the universe. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you go back to the creation of a single cell that has this incredible complexity that eventually, through the process of evolution, leads to human beings. Yeah, but I, I do think there's... Do you believe that's really I, I do the think, most likely scenario? Yeah, I do think there's incredible evidence of intelligent design at the point of the origin of life. Because that first simple cell... Um, in the 19th century, Thomas Huxley said that the cell is a simple homogenous globule of undifferentiated protoplasm. <laughs> And Brilliant I'm, phrase. I, I'm wonderful. He was one of the great scientists of the 19th century, but we know so much more now that he didn't know. And that what we now know that is that inside even the simplest cell, we have digital nanotechnology. Mm. We have the information stored in the DNA. We have an exquisite uh, system of information trans, uh, uh, storage, transmission, and processing. And, and that information is being used to build protein machines and, uh, and other even more complex nanomachinery mm. inside the cell. So it's a sort of automated factory run by digital information. People didn't know about that in the early 19th century. But do you believe, like I said, originally there's just one single solitary cell that's created? Well, right. I, presumably that's where... Is that what you think? I, I, I do think there was a, a, an original cell that was created. Because the theory of evolution says the journey from single cell to the full complexity of life on Earth and so on happened by random trial and error. But your position, I think, is that it's so complicated, this original single cell, so complex for all the reasons you've just articulated, that that's just simply not feasible, that it would be just random trial and error. It had to be the creation of some superior entity. Right. Am I, is that right? Well, again, there's two contexts. There's the how do you get to the first cell, and then how do you get from the first cell to everything right. else. Let's just take the origin of the so first you cell. So you think the creator of the universe is God? I do. And then out of the universe comes the creation of a single cell, which again is God. Right. Um, here's the evidence, though, that when, when we see information in a, a, a digital or alphabetic or typographic form, and this is what we actually see in the DNA. Mm -hmm. When Francis Crick elucidated what he called the sequence hypothesis in the late 1950s, he realized that the four subunits along the interior of the DNA um, are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written text or, or digital characters in a section of software. What we know from experience is that whenever we say information of that sort, mm -hmm. It always comes from a mind. Bill Gates, our local hero, has said that DNA is like a software program, but much more complex than any we've ever devised. Richard Dawkins has acknowledged that it functions like a machine code. Mm. Well, what we know is that software comes from a programmer. And in fact, whenever we see information of that kind, whether it's in a software program or a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book, it always arises from a mind, not a material process. So the, the discovery of information at the foundation of life and even the simplest living cell I argue, is decisive evidence of the activity of a designing mind in the origin of life.